of the Middle East, strategically located bordering Turkey from the north, Iraq from the east, Jordan from the south, and Israel, Lebanon, and the Mediterranean Sea from the west. Syria's relationship with the United States had its ups and downs, and it is directly related to its foreign policy and its relationship with its neighbors. We are very fortunate this evening to be joined by the ambassador of Syria to discuss these matters. Ambassador Mustafa holds a doctorate degree in computer science. In addition to Arabic, he is fluent in French and English with a moderate command of German. Prior to his Washington assignment, he was the dean of the faculty of the information technology at the University of Damascus. A consultant to several regional and international organizations on science and technology policies in the Middle East, and a writer in both Arabic and English, he authored, co-authored, and edited several books and wrote over 200 articles in several newspapers. He mainly writes on the political science, on the political scene in Washington, and on U.S. policies. Ambassador Mustafa traveled extremely to deliver lectures in various Arab and American cities and appear in numerous United States, British, Syrian, and Arab TV news programs and shows. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency, the Ambassador of Syria to the United States, Dr. Imad Mustafa. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, I'm honored and humbled being here tonight, invited by your uh, uh, prestigious council. Um, um, I was nicely introduced to you by being described as fluent in English. Well, I pass as fluent in English in Syria, but here I find problems. <laughs> so please do forgive me. Um, I'm not a na native speaker of English. From time to time, I will make some grammatical mistakes. Well, I'm the product of the educational system in Syria. Um, as you have noticed, I'm not a career diplomat. I have always been an academic through, through, throughout my whole life. This is my first diplomatic post ever in my life, and it's here in the United States, and I've been here for uh, a little more than a year. First, I was a chargé d'affaires, which means an ambassador without the title, and then I became a fully-fledged ambassador, and this is not an envious job for me. I think the most difficult job in Washington, D.C., is being an ambassador of a quote-unquote rogue state in the United States of America. <laughs> Now, if you think of the other quote-unquote rogue states, well, they do not have ambassadors. Neither Cuba nor Iran has got uh, diplomatic relations. So I have this unique position in the United States, the only ambassador of a quote-unquote rogue state in the United States of America. However, however, I have to say that it's not as tough as it is. I met with my... Uh, I meet with my counterpart in Damascus regularly, your ambassador to Syria, Margaret Scobie, a capable, efficient, uh, and uh, uh, career diplomat. And um, I think we developed this sympathy and probably an empathy between, among me and her, because uh, she also suffers from uh, this uh, difficult task of representing the United States and Syria. However, I would think that the difference would be that she she uh, uh, enjoys good relations with the Syrian government and with Syrian officials and cabinet ministers and everything. Her difficult task is trying to sell or defend the American policies to the Syrian people. In general, she always tells me that she is warmly treated by the Syrian people. It's, it's, there is no animosity or hatred. It's disagreement on policies. 
extraordinarily enough, and this was uh, a, an eye-opening experience for me because I've never lived in the United States before. And for me, I'm not only representing Syria here, but I'm also as a human being trying to learn and understand more and more about this great country. Extraordinarily enough, the American people are also treating me very well. Yes, they disagree with policies, but not on a human level. And the most important thing at all is that I do not feel there is any personal animosity. Uh, um, I don't think that anybody here in the United States has ever told me we think Syria is the enemy of the United States. The same applies to the Syrian people. They do not think that America is our enemy. But both, both people and both countries understand that, yes, we do have profound political disagreements. Two, two main, main issues are the reason for these political disagreements. One is, is older than myself. I was born after the Middle East crisis happened, and of course it has everything to do with the uh, 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 Israeli-Palestinian issue. The other is very recent. I was involved thoroughly with this other issue, I mean the Iraqi war or the invasion of Iraq or the occupation of Iraq or what you might call it the liberation of Iraq, depending on your political viewpoints. Um, I was involved at a very early stage in this, even before I came here. And uh, 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 in a way or another, I think that, uh, as you all know, Syria has uh, opposed opposed this war on Iraq on a principled basis from the very early stages of it, even before it actually happened. And in a way or another, US-Syrian relations paid dearly for this, what we call in Syria, a principled opposition to the war on Iraq. Uh, however, I was not invited today here to discuss American-Syrian relations. I was invited to address the following question. Is uh, an Arab-Israeli peace feasible? Is it doable? Or at least from my perspective, my viewpoint, is a Syrian-Israeli peace a possible scenario? So what I will do is the following. I will stick to what my, my hosts have asked me to do, but I will speak shortly for like something like three or four hours. And then, <laughs> then I will leave I will leave some time, like 10 or 15 minutes, for you to, <laughs> to ask me whatever questions you would like to ask. Um, my question is not a political, my answer is not a political answer. It's something I profoundly believe in. The answer is plain and square. It is yes, definitely, it's doable, it's feasible. Peace can't be reached. We just want some, some guts and some in a way or another, let me say, some uh, uh, creative leadership. Let me remind you of some facts. Now, before I remind you of those facts, you will tell yourself, here is a Syrian diplomat spin doctoring Syrian diplomacy. So I will always try to use testimonies that are not known to be pro-Syrian. Um, let me just remind you of this. Had I said, if, if, if I were now here, I mean, if I were in the United States a year ago, and I would have said this, the sort of things I'm going to say right now, I'm sure that 90% of you would not believe me, and they would say this is just a propaganda mouthpiece of Syria. But at least now I can, uh, uh, I can substantiate my claims using evidence from top three American politicians. Uh, and I will tell you who they are right now. Um, let me start by telling you this. In Syria, this is our, our reading of the situation. In the past 10 years, we were almost on the verge of signing a peace treaty with Israel at least three times in the past 10 or 12 years. Thrice, we missed a historic opportunity, not because of things Syria did or things Syria didn't, but because of a mixture of tragic circumstances on one case, uh, a political miscalculation on the other case, the second case, and political cowardice on the third case. I'll tell you what I mean, and then I will substantiate my story with evidence I think is irref irrefutable, and then I, I would uh, uh, move into another subject. Uh, Yes, we were on the verge of signing a peace treaty with Israel when Itzhak Rabin was the Prime Minister of Israel. 
Uh, we in Syria believe that Itzhak Rabin was a visionary leader who believed that peace between Israel and the Arabs can be reached, and, and he extended a hand towards Syria. This hand is, is called, famously now in the political jargon, Rabin's deposit. Hmm? Rabin wrote a letter and handed it to President Clinton saying, we are ready to withdraw to the lines of June 4, 1967 in return of complete peace with Syria, comprehensive peace. And of course, this was uh, uh, the this, this spark that initiated peace talks between Syria and Israel. And the United States played a vital, pivotal role in, in brokering this, this peace. And as we said, we believed in Syria that that's it. We, we, we've reached it. It's a historic peace. And everybody knows what happened. Uh, uh, Rabin got assassinated. Uh, of course, the Israeli people felt uh, profound sorrow for this, but we in Syria uh, uh, felt that uh, 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 that was a, a historic catastrophe. However, however, uh, his successor, Shimon Peres, immediately, soon once he became a prime minister, sent us messages through the, through the Americans, of course, telling us that he's even more committed and he even believes more than Rabin himself that reaching peace with Syria would be uh, 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 the key to having peace between Israel and all, all the Arab nations. Syria would be the, the gateway from which Israel can really reach uh, peace with all the other Arabs. And uh, we resumed peace negotiations. And we were there once more within a year of uh, Rabin's assassination. And then uh, Perez thought thought he that uh, he must uh, solidify his political standing in Israel, and he decided to call for general elections. We thought in Syria that that would be catastrophic. Uh, no, we didn't think that would be catastrophic. We worried a lot. We thought, what if, what if he loses the elections because his opponent, Netanyahu, was publicly criticizing him and criticizing Rabin uh, before him for trying to reach a peace agreement with Syria. So we worried a lot, and our worst expectations became true. He lost, Netanyahu came, and everything collapsed. And for three years, we did not exchange a single uh, message between us and them. And even and this, this is well documented in the memories of Madeleine Albright, Bill Clinton, but most importantly, the hugely detailed memoirs of Dennis Ross, the, the American envoy to the Middle East through 12 years. Uh, his book has been published three, three months ago. Uh, it's entitled The Missing Peace, and he tells the Syrian-Israeli story in detail. And anybody can go and read it. Nobody will accuse Dennis Ross of sympathizing with Syria or being anti-Israeli. Actually, he dedicates his first chapter uh, uh, to Israel, glorifying Israel, and, and telling how pr <coughs> profoundly attached to Israel he was, both as an American as, and as a, a, a Jew. So at least I would consider his testimony an objective testimony. We did not like everything that we read in his book in Syria, but at least we told ourself, ourselves 95% of his testimony coincides with our, our reading of the history in the past 15 years. So at least 95% is, is uh, an ample space of, of agreement. Back to, to the story, what happened is, of course, uh, uh, with Netanyahu, peace was impossible. Netanyahu had this simple uh, uh, formula. If Syria wants to have peace, let them just sign peace with us. We will not return their occupied territories to them. We will give no concessions. If, the, if Syria is sincere about having peace, let them just sign peace with us. Of course, the same is echoed today by Sharon, but at least Sharon is even more practical, and I will tell you how. Uh, than uh, Netanyahu was. But then, three years later, Netanyahu lost the elections and Barak became the prime minister of Israel. And Barak immediately sent a message to Syria. He wanted to resume peace talks. And this time, it was a very different story. He insisted that we should go back to point zero. We told him, but we already had Rabin's deposit, which was the basis on which we started our peace talks. And then we had a more advanced a more advanced understanding with Perez, and it would be a, and we wasted five years, five years, and, and uh, but he insisted we should go back to point zero. 
and we went back to point zero. This time it was different. It was not between the leaders of both nations and the, the intermediary channels of the United States. This time we had committees, bilateral committees, working on every issue. We had a committee for water resources. We had a committee for borders markup. We had a committee for uh, uh, mutual security arrangements. We had a committee for uh, uh, diplomatic exchanges once peace is signed. We, have a committee, we had a committee for trade exchanges. You name it, it's there. We still have the draft copies of all those documents. They were actually initialized. At the very end, when we, for the third time, believed that peace was there, it was there for the taking, Barack, this is, this is the interpretation or the explanation of Dennis Ross. Barack started getting negative polls, and he decided that he does not want to go through a Syrian peace agreement. He chickened out, and everything collapsed. Of course, Barack lost the elections. Ariel Sharon became the prime minister of Israel. Ariel Sharon has publicly said, I know what price Syria wants for peace. I'm not ready to give Syria this price. They want back their occupied Golan Heights. I'm not going to give Syria back this. However, even in Israel itself today, the debate, the debate in Israel is not whether Syria is genuine or not. The debate today in Israel, and it's a public debate, you can read it in, in the Israeli newspapers, Haaretz, Marif, Jerusalem Post. The debate is Sharon is wrong, and this is a historic opportunity that we are losing for the third time, and we must grab this opportunity. The Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has made his, this as explicit and public as possible. He actually has repeated his peace initiative towards Israel in, in, in international venues like the New York Times. In a famous interview he, he had with the New York Times four months ago, or five months ago, forgive me for the memory lapse, he, he repeated his offer to, pre, to resume peace negotiations with Israel. Um, today, today I, I happen to know the following. This is a personal story. I can't solidify it, but at least you can, if you want, you can believe me on this. I arranged for Ambassador Martin Endick to go to Damascus a month ago and to meet with President Assad. He has never met with him before, so he he wanted this opportunity to, to know him on a personal basis. He met with him. It was a lengthy meeting for three hours, and he immediately left, left Damascus to Jerusalem, where he met with Sharon. Of course, I wasn't with them when I, he met with Sharon. And he came back, and he told me this. So at least I'm, I'm not give, telling you secrets, and, but at least I'm telling you who said this to me. He said, I said to Sharon, you know, th there is a historic opportunity there. and and." you shouldn't miss it. And Sharon simply repeated, I don't want to give back the Golan Heights to Syria. However, Martin Endick met with top military leaders in Israel in the same trip. And they said to him, from the strategic viewpoint, we think, we think that giving Syria back its territories uh, is good even for Israel itself, because we want a long-term peace with Syria, we don't think that this strip of land is vital and strategic for the defense of Israel. In a new, a new warfare, in, in this modern world, you don't need a strip of land to actually defend or launch an attack on another country. And when I'm saying this, I'm giving you names. And he named, he named the Israeli chief of staff and the deputy chief of staff. Those are Israeli army generals. So we are not talking about people who are not concerned for the security of Israel who, or who are misled, simp simplistic, naive people who doesn't understand anything about anything. These are the, 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 the chiefs of the Israeli army. And they are the military experts who know whether this would endanger Israel or not. Now. We have not changed our position. We have not changed our position on the possibility of a, a peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors. We still believe that this is feasible. We believe, of course, that with Sharon it will never happen because he has repeatedly and explicitly said, I'm not interested in making peace with Syria. He's not interested in making peace with the Palestinians. Everybody everybody knows about this today because his his 
political consultant or advisor has explicitly said what lies behind his plan for Gaza. It's about we leave Gaza, but we will never, we will never uh, 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 make a comprehensive peace deal with the Palestinians. Having said this, I'm not trying to tell you Israel is the bad guy and we are the good guys. I'm just trying to tell you this is the situation today and it can change. My personal belief is that it will only change when the Israelis will realize that however powerful they are, however their military might, might be, they will never have peace until it is a, a fair and a just peace with all their neighbors. Once they understand and accept that they, their neighbors have equal rights to them, and that as much, uh, as much fears as they have, we also have our fears. Once they realize this, and once they realize that their grandchildren and our grandchildren can only live in peace together, if all grandchildren feel that they are dignified and equal to each other, not that we are defeated and they are victorious, only then, only then Israel will realize the necessity for peace and the Israeli electorate, the Israeli people, will elect an Israeli government that will have the historic courage to reach peace with its neighbors. Had I said all this a year ago, people would say to me, this is a big lie. Everybody knows that Syria is the rejectionist extremist country and Israel is the peace-loving country. This cannot be said even here in the United States anymore because there has been one story after another, one story after another repeating exactly what I have said. Once Dennis Ross published his book, Barak was severely criticized, it, both in Dennis Ross' book and in Clinton's book, in Clinton's memoirs, for missing this opportunity for peace. Barak wrote uh, an editorial d denying that this has happened. But we did not need in Syria to say, no, Dennis Ross was telling the truth and Barak wasn't. What happened is his chief peace negotia negotiator, uh, s s sorry for, for the Moshe Segi, anyone can help me with the name? wrote an, an editorial saying, no, Dennis Ross is telling the truth and Barak is not telling the truth. The Syrians were serious and engaged and they really wanted to reach a peace agreement. It was us, the Israelis, who, who uh, had a U-turn at the very last moment. Um, as I told you, we still believe that peace can be achieved, probably not today, but it will be achieved one day or another. The great tragedy is, till this is achieved, people will continue being killed on semi-daily basis in our region. This is a, tra a tragic loss for humanity. Forget about whether those people are Palestinians or Israelis. Forget about the fact that per one Israeli killed, there is like 15 or 20 Palestinians killed. For me, this is, this is uh, uh, I mean, uh, out of the question. Every loss of a human life is a, a loss for all humanity, regardless of whether they are Jews or Muslims, Palestinians or Israelis, Syrians or Egyptians or Lebanese. This situation will only end when a comprehensive peace will prevail. And this will only happen when all sides realize the need for a comprehensive peace on a dignified, honorable, and fair standing. Uh, this is my message in brief. I don't want to, to talk a lot. I would prefer to, to, to leave more time for Q&A, and I, I, I would respectfully answer any question you address. Thank you very much. Well, we thank you for a, a very clear portrait of the uh, diplomacy over the uh, Arab-Israeli controversy over the past decade. Thanks very, very much. The question uh, is, first of all, an assertion that the Israeli ambassador, when speaking here this past spring, uh, asserted that there had been weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. They're presently in Syria. The question is, what would have prompted him to say that? Uh, this is a preposterous statement. In a way or another, l l let me try to understand this logic. So Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. 
And you know now he's, he's humiliated in a prison, but he, he decided not to use them. So he decided to send them to Syria. Now we have them. So now in Syria we have weapons of mass destruction, and we will threaten the whole world with them. But once they decide to, as an example, to invade us, we will send them to Saudi Arabia or to Jordan or somewhere else. We, we will never not use them, just like Saddam never used them. You know what? I will tell you this. Um, it's a vicious circle of accusations and counter accusations, of accusations and refutations. At one point, let me say this to you. I, I will be very candid with you. A, a couple of weeks after the invasion of Iraq, the sense of bravado within this administration was so high that they were discussing, if you remember, go back a year ago, is Syria next, is Syria next? And suddenly, on daily basis, top American officials were appearing on TV screen saying, Syria has a huge arsenal of weapons of mass destruction. And I'm, I will be very candid with you. We are a very small nation. We, we already have a formidable foe facing us, Israel, that we, we, can't, we can't kick Israel out from our own occupied territories. We don't want another formidable foe deciding whether they want to invade Syria or not. And we decided that in, instead of just saying, no, this is untrue, we do not have such a, an arsenal, we decided to be more proactive instead of being reactive. I was personally involved in this, so it's in a way or another a personal story. We went to the United Nations Security Council, and we, we tabled, because we were members of the Security Council at that time, we tabled a draft resolution asking the United States nations to declare the Middle East a region absolutely free from all weapons of mass destruction and, most importantly, imposing a strict regimen of, of, of inspection and with all the modalities and mechanisms required to ensure that this is enforced on all countries of the Middle East. Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, you name it, including Israel. Of course, the United States immediately, immediately refused this. They said, there's no way we will accept this. And suddenly, and please do believe me, this is a personal story that I lived through it. Suddenly, not a single American official was appearing on American TV channels anymore accusing Syria of having weapons of mass destruction. But we are still there. If the United States feel that we have weapons of mass destruction, we would welcome, we would welcome uh, an international resolution, not a unilateral one, that will impose a Middle East absolutely free from all weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, biological, you name it, we will support it. This is Syria's official position. And every time, every time I meet with officials at the State Department, I repeat this to them. Every time, they never even discuss it with me. They only say, OK, we, we took note of this. Thank you very much. And then they immediately change the subject. The this question is, is, would you comment upon the difference between the Ba'athist party in, in Syria and really formerly Iraq? Well, I mean, it's very difficult for me to explain the difference between a, the theoretical difference between a party and another. I'm not a member of the Ba'ath party myself. I have never been a member of this party. I respect it a lot, just like any other party. But there is a problem here. The problem is, you know, uh, it's, it's a political party and it has been demonized here in the United States. Rightly or wrongly, I'm not going to discuss this, but I think the problem was never ever the party. It was the regime. It was Saddam Hussein himself. Now, you have mentioned this. Yes, Syria has always been a sworn enemy of Saddam Hussein. This fact is very little known in the United States of America. We used to be among the first countries to suffer from the evil genius of Saddam Hussein. In the early 1980s, he used to, to, he used to send lorries loaded with explosives to be put off in the streets of Damascus and Aleppo, another major, uh, cap major city in Syria. And lots of Syrians were killed by Saddam Hussein at that time. And, but luckily for us, and unfortunately for others, he launched his war on Iran, so he forgot about us. And for 10 years, he sent his, his people to, be, to kill and be killed in Iran. And everybody knows that for 10 years, for 10 years, Saddam Hussein was the, the, the best friend of the West because he was fighting Iran. And the West was happily watching tens of thousands of young Iraqis and young Iranians being killed in a, a silly, absurd, futile war. Suddenly, suddenly, 
Once this uh, uh, war stopped between uh, Iraq and Iran, uh, Saddam Hussein turned his, his vicious interest towards Kuwait, and of course you know the, the rest of the history. So yes, the fact is Syria and the sub regime of Saddam Hussein has always been uh, sworn enemies. Actually, we never had an embassy in Baghdad during the reign of Saddam Hussein. We never. We have just resumed political uh, diplomatic relations with Iraq, with Iraq, only like something like six months ago after Allah became uh, the prime minister of Iraq. What I want to say is, I'm not saying that the Syrian people and the Iraqi people do not have the closest of relations. We are almost like one people, but the political relations between the government in Damascus and the government in Baghdad was oscillating between terrible, terrible animosity and hostility or, or uh, lukewarm hatred. That's it. it. It has never been different from this. <laughs> having said this, having said this, please do understand this. We did oppose the American war on Iraq. I remember I was in meetings in which we told our American counterparts, please do listen to us. Never underestimate local knowledge. We understand our region. We do not believe that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, and we do not believe that Iraq, as you are claiming, is closely tied to Al-Qaeda. We happen to understand that the Al-Qaeda, who are extremist, religious, fundamentalist organization, uh, port look at Saddam Hussein as the devil incarnate. So please don't try to simplify things or to create things that are untrue. This is on one hand. On the other hand, we were telling the Americans, don't come and inflame our region. We do not need yet another war in our region. What we already have is enough. If we, I, I was there, I was there. We were telling the Americans, we believe that if you invade Iraq, you are opening a Pandora's box of woes and evils that will never be closed. Nobody will know how to close it. And you will inflame extremism and terrorism in our region. Yes, we do hate Saddam Hussein. We, we, we don't have a lot of love for him. But we do not want more problems in our region. Probably we were wrong. I'm not claiming that we know everything. But our reading of the situation to today exonerates our fears before the war. This is what we thought. And this is what we were afraid of. And probably, probably some of our worst fears are happening today. Let me give you this example. Uh, yesterday, you heard about the attacks on churches in Iraq. Now, let me surprise you. Syria is a predominantly Muslim country. 70% of the Syrians are Muslims. But we have 30% who are non-Muslims, Christians. But this is insignificant. 30% or 60% or 55% is insignificant. We in Syria, we pride ourselves for our Christian heritage. Damascus is mentioned in the New Testament. The street, that is, the street that is called Straight is still today in Damascus, and it is still called Straight. St. Paul the Apostle went from Damascus to, 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 to spread the Christian word throughout the, the old world. We in Syria, Muslims and Christians alike, pride ourselves for our Christian heritage. It's a part of our national heritage, national culture. This is something we cherish, all of us together, Muslims and Christians together. The same applies, and I will tell you later, about our Jewish heritage in Syria. But what I'm trying to say is, Iraq also has had a Christian tradition and a Christian cultural heritage for at least 2,000 years. The Christians today in Iraq are fleeing away from Iraq, leaving Iraq. 30,000 Christian Iraqis have left and fled to Syria, where they have found a safe haven. But, and this was before the latest attacks, yes, attacks yesterday. For us in Syria, we, we, we believe that there is a, a sinister conspiracy that is trying to drive the Christians out of Iraq. And, and, and if you try to understand this, let me tell you this story. Um, I was born in Syria when Israel was already established, and there's almost no Jews in Syria. But I read in many books that Jews have always been a part of our cultural heritage in Syria. But then they, they left. The end of the story. Of course, uh, I had my, my, 
my studies, and I went to England for my PhD, and then I came back to Damascus teaching at the university. I'm not a political person. I became a political person. This is destiny. But I'm t telling you a story from my life before I came here. Um, I always knew that we had a Jewish heritage in Syria. But that's it. It's knowledge, abstract. I never met something. I, I never had a personal experience with our Jewish heritage. Then I came here. So I, I remember nine months ago, nine months ago, uh, 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 I was at a wedding, and an elderly gentleman came to me, and he said to me, I am 70 years old, and I have a dream that is at least 50 years old. I said to him, and what is your dream? He said to me, you know what, I'm, I'm a Jewish of Syrian descent, and my dream is to visit Syria, to visit Aleppo, the city of my father and my mother, and to pray by the tombs of the graves of my grandparents. And I immediately, immediately, just like this, I told him, well, consider your dream granted. He wouldn't believe me. He's a gentleman, I told you, almost 70 years old. Uh, he said to me, what do you mean? Do you mean I can go to Syria and come back safely? I'm, I'm Jewish. I told him, definitely you can. He, he, he loved what I said, but I don't think he took me seriously on the, my offer. But what I did is I decided to pursue this. So I went back to my embassy, and I wrote a letter to the chief uh, Sephardic rabbi in Brooklyn, in New York, because the Jews of Syria were Sephardic. As you know, Jews are either Ashkenazi or Sephardic. Um, and I told him I would love to accompany a visiting Jewish delegation that might be interested in visiting Syria, I would go personally with them. I, th I thought, as an ambassador, this would give them some, you know, in their subconscious, some s safety, uh, 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 f a feeling of safety that we are accompanied by the official representative of the country. So uh, to make this sh the story very short, eventually I went with these people. Uh, we landed in the airport in Damascus. According to their request, the first thing they wanted to do was immediately from the airport, they wanted to go to the Jewish cemetery in Damascus. So we left the airport immediately to the Jewish cemetery. And there they had uh, like a, a lifetime experience. This is a, a 900 years old cemetery. Uh, it's huge and it's intact, clean well-kept, well-preserved, not a single grave uh, desecrated. I'm sorry if I misuse the word. Help me on this, desecrated, <laughs> yes. And, and they were amazed, and they immediately started videotaping it, telling me, nobody back in America will believe this. A Jewish cemetery in the heart of Damascus, so well-preserved and so respected by a, a predominantly Muslim neighborhood, we can't believe this, it's, it's illogical. This is not the story. The story is a personal story. I accompanied these people. They were going around. And I, I learned more ab and more about the Jewish cultural heritage in Syria. And I felt a great loss, a great loss. These people were with us. They lived with us for 3,000 years. This is their claim. I'm not a history uh, expert. They said to me, we lived happily in concord, in harmony, with other Syrians for 3,000 years. It's only the past 50 years because of the Middle East conflict and the, the founding of Israel that we had this rift, but never before. The amazing thing was wherever they went throughout Syria, because they moved through Syrian cities, they were warmly met by ordinary Syrian people, wherever they met. And for me, this was uh, an eye-opening experience and an educational experience. I learned more about my people and my country than I have ever learned before. So back to Iraq, I'm telling you this story. What's happening today in Iraq, at least on a personal level, I look at it with, with panic and fear. Iraq is losing today a part of its cultural heritage. The Christians are running away from Iraq, looking for safe havens elsewhere. This is only one aspect of the, the, the multidimensional horrors Iraq is living today. I do not want to, to, to bore you with all the details I know about Iraq, so forgive me. And, and thank you. Would you care to advise the American government about Iraq and <laughs> exit? Once I was visited a porcelain shop in, in, I think it was in 
Amsterdam. And the, the owner of the shop was a bit obnoxious, and he said to me, be careful. If you break it, you own it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I, now to be to be very serious with you and with with absolute honesty and sincerity, nobody in the whole world today, nobody in the whole world knows how to to fix what has happened in Iraq. There is no simple exit strategy. If you leave immediately, it will be terrible and chaotic. If you stay, it will be terrible and chaotic. I don't think. Forget about the, what you hear on TV. I, I, I meet regularly with people from this administration. We talk serious things. We, we do not exchange political niceties. We discuss realities on the ground. And I get reports about what's happening in Iraq. And of course, I meet, we meet with our counterparts in neighboring countries, in Jordan, in Turkey, in Iran, in, in Saudi Arabia. And I even meet with some people that are a bit close to the Kerry camp. I have never ever heard anyone suggesting that there is a, an easy, simple, straightforward exit strategy from Iraq. Uh, I, I do not believe this is possible. It, it aches my heart to say this, but this is the truth. We worry a lot about three things today in Iraq. Syria has one strategy towards Iraq today. It's the first the preservation of, its, of Iraq's territorial integrity. We fear a lot that Iraq might disintegrate. We, we have this fear and we hope this will not happen. We fear that if this happens in Iraq, it might have a domino effect in our region. It's an, another balkanization of our region. We do not want this to happen. We also fear about the stability uh, of, of Iraq and, and the, the you know, it's a lawless situation there. The ordinary Iraqi people forget about politics, about insurgents, resistance, terrorists. Forget about all this. Ordinary Iraqi people are not living happily today in Iraq. Forget about the politics. The general situation is not a situation in which people are feeling comfortable or secure at all. Uh, there is lawlessness, crimes, uh, uh, armed dealers, uh, drug dealers, uh, gangs kidnapping people just to get ransoms. For I'm not discussing at all the political struggle between Iraqis and Americans, or let's say certain Iraqis and uh, Americans. I'm talking about the general lawless uh, situation in Iraq. I, I have never heard any serious, forget about the election campaign, any serious American official or any serious official from the campaign, uh, the Kerry campaign, discussing uh, 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 a realistic exit strategy for Iraq. I've not heard of this. We don't know what will happen. As I told you, it's not an easy situation. The, the question is, would you care to comment upon the initiation of the Six-Day War? Yes. Um, look, it's, it's, it's very easy. I know that uh, because I'm the Syrian ambassador, I would say what everybody knows Syria would say, of course, everybody in the whole world knows that Israel was the one who attacked its neighbors. But then, I'm not, I'm not here to spin doctor things to you. I know that the Israelis would say, well, we had to do this because if we didn't do this, they would have attacked us. But at least, at least, what I will tell you is this. First, first, uh, uh, Last summer, last summer, the State Department here in Washington declassified for the first time ever all documents related to the 1967 or the so-called Six-Day War between Israel and the Arabs. Everybody knows that in the, in the, uh, at the dawn of June the 5th, 1967, Israeli Air Force attacked uh, the Arab airports in Cairo and Damascus and Amman. They destroyed all the Arab uh, uh, fighting jets. And once they, they guaranteed, uh, I'm not a military expert, so forgive me for giving you this harsh out. Once they guaranteed the, the air, superiority. air superiority, they were able easily to take the lands they have taken and that we discuss with them now, telling them, if you really want peace with us, give us back our lands. But I don't want to go back into history and to bore you with um, with accusations and, and, and uh, counter accusations. What I want to say is the following. Uh, the State Department did release those documents. Historians were eager 
to study these documents. They studied these documents for the first time ever. Now they are public property. This only happened last summer, so it's a, a, a fairly recent event. I was there as a student, not as a historian. I just sat and watched historians from Israel, the United States, and the Arab world discussing those documents. And there was a, a, a unanimous agreement on two things. First is that, yes, Israel was the one who started, initiated this war. It was not the Arabs. But this is well known to everybody. Even Israel does not deny it. But the second most important thing was there was a unanimous agreement by all historians. And because, especially after they read all the intelligence reports from the American embassies and all the analysis reports done by top military officials, that at that day, at that time, even if the Arabs launched the war, Israel enjoyed 20 times more military superiority that it could have easily crushed an Arab attack and launched a, a, a counterattack itself. Regardless of history, this, is, this has happened. Forget about it, let's think of today. Today we are telling the Israelis, if you really want to be accepted in this region, if you really want to have peace, you have to give us back our territories. As simple as that. Thank you. The, the first comment is there have been rough times in the relations between Syrians and, and Jews. Uh, the second observation, in uh, 1996, um, the endorsement by the Syrian government of uh, terrorist groups uh, undercut uh, peace negotiations. And then the question was, would you, uh, he, uh, Professor Friedman believes that uh, Syria, it is said, according to Indic, is willing to begin talks without uh, uh, any reservations, what would be the advantages of this? And then you, of course, could fill all of that out. <laughs> this is, okay, well, well, first we will start with your accusation about us killing Jews, uh, uh, um, or, or causing the death of Jews. I will tell you two stories, and I will, I will not, not go uh, into this subject more and more. Um, seven months ago, I was invited by uh, a prominent group of Jewish leaders in Los Angeles to meet with them. So I went there. Uh, they were some, a group of seven or eight gentlemen. Th three or four of them were rabbis. Two of them were the, the curators of the Simon Weisenthal Center in Los Angeles. The first thing they did, the first thing they did was, just after we we we, we finished the the initial, uh, uh, I mean, uh, exchanges of pleasant words, they immediately took a document from their plastic bag, threw it on the table, and they, this was the beginning of the meeting. And they said to me, "What is your comment on this book that was published in Damascus and that is strongly anti-Semitic?" And I told them, look, I'll tell you something. When I was leaving my office in, in Washington, D.C., my secretary followed me. She, she said to me, don't forget to take this with you. I told her, what is this? She said to me, those are documents uh, documenting Israeli atrocities against the Palestinians and what they did and, and you know, terrible things. I told them, I'm not going to Los Angeles to, mod the, to meet these people and to tell them how bad they are and to hear from them how bad we are. I'm, I'm, I'm really going there to, to explore the possibility of building a bridge. They immediately withdrew the book, put it back in the bag, and they never discussed it anymore. What I'm trying to say is, in every society in the whole world, in every country, you will, you will find good guys, bad guys, terrible people, uh, uh, good Samaritans, this happens everywhere in the world. But this is what I believe, and this is my second story. Uh, instead of me telling you how well we treated the Jews in Syria, go and meet with the Jewish Syrian community in Brooklyn. Now I am a frequent visitor to all their weddings, all, all their bar mitzvahs, or everything. Only a month ago, they invited me to attend a wedding and this really touched me. And the grand rabbi, the chief rabbi uh, of the Sephardic Jews, who is chief rabbi for all Jews coming from Morocco, from Turkey, from Iran, from Syria, from Yemen, from a, a number of countries, invited me to the platform. And this was a wedding. I felt humbled, but he insisted. And he, I stood next to him. He's a gentleman, something like 82, 83 years old. I'm almost like his great-grandchild. 
and, and he said this to me. He said this to me. He said, for 3,000 years, you treated us so well, so well. We, all, we only left Syria with broken hearts. And we, we never ever our community has been happier than our opportunity to go back and visit Syria three, four months ago. We are so pleased. And now we are organizing more and more of those trips. But he said this in front of his community. For 3,000 years, you treated us so well. Now, of course, here in the United States, you will hear stories about how bad we were to the Jews. I'm not going to, to refute these stories. Go and ask this Jewish Syrian community in Brooklyn. They count 75,000 people. And there are 15,000 Syrian Jews in uh, northern New Jersey and 10,000 Syrian Jews in Long Island. Go and ask these people. I'm not going to tell their story. They know how to tell their story themselves. As for uh, 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 the, the, what, I mean, you are saying that uh, uh, Syria is ready to resume peace talks, forgetting about Rabin's deposit. What I'm trying to say is this. Even Sharon himself, even Sharon understands you can't have peace with someone if, if, you, if your premise is that you have defeated him. Now he's sur this is surrender. This is not peace. So Sharon will, I mean, had the political shrewdness of understanding and saying this to Martin and you know what? I understand what Syria needs for peace. They want back their Golan Heights. I, I'm not ready to give them the Golan Heights. So forget about peace with Syria. The Israeli army officers understood it in a different reality. Their job, they are not politicians. They do not have an ideology. They do not have a, an electorate. They understand what is needed to, to defend Israel in their viewpoint. And they said to Endek, as explicitly as possible, we do not need the Golan to defend Israel. We know how to defend Israel. This is our job. I'm not talking on their behalf. I'm reminding you of what they said. I do not want to go into Israeli politics and to, to, to become a, a, a hawk or a dove. This is none of my business. We in Syria, we know strategically we have made a strategic, what we call our strategic option for peace, which means definitely, categorically, we want back our Golan Heights, but we're not going to war to get these heights back from Israel, we will try to engage Israel peacefully to get back our heights, our occupied territories. This is what we call our strategic option for peace. If Israel today is not ready, we will wait. One day it, they will reach a, an understanding that they need to do this. It's not only good for Syria, it's also good for Israel itself. On the question of human rights, uh, what is your opinion about major abusers and what is your country's agenda with respect to human rights? This is another thorny issue. Um, let me state first this, that you can easily have double standards. So you can put people in Guantanamo and deprive them of their legal rights and they, well, this is because we are, we are fighting terrorism. And then you can point a finger at a, another country that you politically dislike and you say, look, Sy Syria or, or Jordan or Tunisia is doing this or that. But at least, at least there is one valid principle that I personally adhere to and I would like to see applied everywhere in the world, including Syria. Let me first humbly and honestly admit that Syria is not Switzerland. And let me say that this does not make me laugh. It makes me, uh, I mean, embarrassed, and I, f I don't feel well about saying this. But at least, at least, I have a vision that I believe in. And at least I know that today the human rights situation in Syria is, is, is in, 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 how would I say, ti 10 times, hundreds of times better than it used to be, and I know that it is improving nonstop. The margins of civil liberties, at least, are, are expanding nonstop. I can say to you today that the situation is far from ideal in a country like Syria today, but it is many times better than it used to be 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, it used to be many times better than it used to be 20 years ago. Please do remember, please do remember that uh, uh, this is not an ideal world we live in. But at least there is a vision and there is a commitment. And at, at least I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You in the United States can play either a, a bad, uh, or how would I say, uh, 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 can put obstacles toward, um, toward improving these, the status of human rights 
in the Middle East, not only in Syria, or you can actually help us improve it. And I will give you an example. The United States has applied sanctions against Syria. The Europeans have used a diff opted to, uh, for a different policy towards Syria. They went to Syria and they signed with us a partnership agreement. They told us, as an example, we will help you on liberalizing your economy, opening up uh, uh, trade, I mean, the trade barriers, uh, better exchanges between us and you. But on the other hand, you have to do certain things. As an example, you have to improve your record on human rights. And I think this is a very wise and positive approach. It, it, it is an approach in which you engage someone constructively. Uh, on the other hand, let me tell you this about the United States, and, and, and I, I think you will like what you will hear. The Congress is severely criticizing Syria the U.S. Congress for not allowing, for not allowing enough access for the Syrian people to the internet. The Congress believes that enough access to the internet will empower the Syrian people. Now I come from an information technology background and I'm involved personally in this. What, what the Congress ignores is the following. Yes, in Syria, we do not have what we call an information superhighway. We do not have broadband and ISDN. We only have a dial-up service. And a dial-up service is a very slow service, and the Syrian people are frustrated. Now, what I happen to know, and I have been saying this to the American officials time and again, that we launched in Syria two years ago a strategic, a strategic initiative to, to build uh, what we call the information superhighway backbone in Syria. So even the the... the the remotest village in Syria will have high-speed access to the internet. Guess what? The main obstacle we are facing are sanctions imposed by the United States on internet-related technologies to sell to Syria. So the Congress, on one hand, is criticizing Syria for not allowing enough access to the internet to the Syrian people, and the Trade Department, on the other hand, is, is imposing export license uh, 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 restrictions on Syria so that it will not get the internet technology. And I have to, we are damned if we do and we are damned if we don't. I have to go to the depart, state, uh, sorry, to the trade department and tell them actually you are damaging the Syrian people, not the Syrian government, by not allowing us high-speed access to the internet. But I will go to the Congress and tell them, instead of talking to us, talk to your officials at the Trade Department and tell them, instead of criticizing Syria, tell them to lift those restrictions on acquiring internet technology. And this is just one example of how a country can either constructively engage in improving a situation it might be critical of, or, or it can put obstacles and put uh, spokes, uh, sorry, uh, sticks between the spokes of a wheel. The, uh, the only onerous part of being moderator is that you have to, at some point, uh, bring an end to a thoroughly enjoyable and always interesting, uh, and in this case, tour de force. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, we thank you for what I think was a very informative evening. Thank you. Thank you.